The problem is that nobody tells you is that at 72 years old, you spend the next 20 years of your life in regret because you weren't happy. And that is not fucking easy. You got your perspective. I just wanna be happy, don't you wanna be happy? Hey everybody, you've been listening to a little bit of sports card conversation <laughs> with Mark Laurie and I. Uh, actually, Mark, why don't you first introduce yourself and then we'll get into it. A L- little bit about who you are uh, and uh, and then we'll get right into it. Sure, yeah. No, I, I'm currently running a Walmart's e-commerce business, but uh, you know, I've always been an entrepreneur, started a bunch of businesses, sold one to Amazon, sold the most recent one to Walmart. That's how I got part of Walmart and been running Walmart's e-com business the last uh, three and a half years now. So let's take it way back. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Staten Island, New York, till I was about- How uh, old are you now? Fifth grade. I, uh, I'm 48. Okay, keep going. Yeah. To about fifth grade? Fifth grade, and then moved to a place called Lincroft, New Jersey, right next to Red Bank, New Jersey, mm-hmm. exit 109 on the parkway, because that's what people do when they talk about yep. New Jersey, right? It's true. Uh, right near Bruce Springsteen. Actually, I was, uh, my st- I actually went to the same gym as Bruce, and <laughs> when I was 16 years old, um, I was in the gym, and he was, we were both just two people in the gym downstairs, you know, in the, in the kind of the garage, and he, like, looks over, and he goes, hey, man, you want to spot me on the bench press? And that was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I led him your life. I went to school the next day. I'm like, you know who asked me to spot them? <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, no, nah, come on, man. No, no photos back then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What kind of kid were you? Uh, I was very scrappy entrepreneurial I did every business you could possibly manage as a kid from lemonade stand as a really little kid to car washes lawn mowing weed picking newspapers recycling, snow shoveling snow shoveling that was a big one for me in this yeah I mean New Jersey area. I mean anything and I was I would basically just outwork anyone you it's know? funny one of my was, friends go ahead that's it yeah yeah my my friend reached out to me. He's like, you t- who grew up with me. He's like, you know, you've told all the good stories about us as kids. He's like, but you haven't talked about your biggest hu- hustle business. And I'm like, and I was excited. I was like, what? And he's like, bro, you don't remember that in Christmas time, we would gather together and you would ring the door. We would ring people's doorbell <laughs> and say, hey, ma'am. Would you like to pay us a dollar for singing Christmas carols? <laughs> He's like, you were a nice Jewish boy ringing the doorbell and saying, hello, ma'am, would you like to pay us a dollar for, for Christmas carols? Hit it, boys, dashing through the snow. I mean, like, literally, <laughs> literally. Any, literally anything for a buck. Literally right? anything yeah. for a buck. Yeah, I was like. Uh, so great. So obviously I associate super well. hard, too. You know, like, it would be like, I would just, like, pick weeds for, like, 12 straight hours, and it was, like. Fine. Mark, like, you know, if back, you if you moved in fifth grade, so you were older than me, great. So like literally when you were in Jersey and I was, I was, you know, 25 exits away from you, which means we basically got the same snowstorms. Yeah. And, <laughs> and when I tell you that my friends still resent me for the fact, because I was also a charismatic leader as a kid, so I could get the energy up. Everyone would run outside, no school, yeah. Nirvana. Everybody run outside, sleds in hand, ready to go. And I would literally will everybody after a 20 minute conversation (laughs) into literally shoveling snow for nine hours. (laughs) (laughs) They they hate me, but it taught me a lot. I had the same, I had the same kind of mentality. It was just weird. It was just. It was in you. Yeah. People always ask me, they're like, how'd you learn? I'm like, it was in me. Yeah. I didn't read a a business book when I was six. By the way, we were talking about sports cards. So what I also did in high school is I started a company called The Mint which basically bought cards direct from the manufacturers and all summer long put together sets with my uh, really close friend, Lax. Um, we would, we Everybody would, needs a Lax. Yeah, Lax. We, we, Lax Chandra. Um, <laughs> Lax was first name? Yeah. Oh, I thought I thought Lax was like classic, like Mike <laughs> Lax Zacharos, yeah, and you it was, have to like cut it, was, it yeah, short. Lax was the first Lax name? Lax short for Lakshman, yeah. I love it. And, uh, and we would literally go in the basement. What, and, what year sets? Cases, 87. 87. Yeah. The worst possible year. Yeah, but the reason I guessed it before you said it. We put together is, hundreds of sets. Bro, it was the apex moment. Yeah. Every single oh. kid for Hanukkah and Christmas during the 87 set yep. got in. Every kid <laughs> in my <laughs> junior high got a set of 87 tops. Yeah. That was and the. And 86 tops traded the year before. Yeah, too. but that was harder to get stuff. You'd have yeah. to go to the US 1 flea market. Yeah. Do you remember that? Well, we used to order. We had We ordered directly. Yeah, you were a little tops. more advanced than me. We had the 86 tops trade. We go to sports. You, know, trading shows you had American parents that probably knew how to do that. My like also Russian parents bought were like, like what? a 
thousand Pete Incovelias, and, <laughs> when, and dude, that's I, just bombed. You know, do you remember Pete Incovelia? Of course, yeah, dude. Like he was a monster. He was a monster, and then we had a that thousand. Was the, I I actually didn't go after Pete, but I went after Benito Santiago. Oh, I went yeah. heavy on Benito Santiago. I all, I crushed with Eric Davis. Oh, I thought Eric Davis was the no, next I, Willie Mays. No, no, Eric Davis too. So Eric Davis and Pete Incovelia, those are two. But Eric Davis. We learned my. We learned a really good lesson. We had like 200 Eric Davises stolen. It was out on the trade show in a thing, Fuck. and we just turned around like, "Where's Eric Davis? Where's Eric Davis? Somebody stole." Yeah. Him. Why well, do we I, have 200 yeah, out on the I, table? You know, it's cr- it's crazy. The other guy, you know, who I got murdered on, Corey Snyder. Oh yeah, the Olympic card he got the destroyed <laughs> on him. I thought Olympic he was the. <laughs> I thought he was Pete Rose in the making. <laughs> that was that era. But you know, it's funny. Where did you do shows? Malls, JCCs, yeah, malls, fire stations, all that yeah, shit, all right? That shit, yeah. Fire Dude, the, stations, we had the same. Malls, up, I mean, it makes so much everything. sense that we have so much crossover. It makes yeah. so much sense. But then okay. I started. I started to. Uh, this is the thing. I right idea, but didn't know about about really grading at the time. But well, grading. I basically, be- you know, bought every Cal Ripken Jr. I could find, and this was, you know, before he really became like, you know, what he is today. Did had you get hot because he had a hitting streak? Because I remember it? I went to a bar mitzvah around that time and everyone's talking about Ripken. Like he was just such a great player at that yeah. point too. Yeah. But he, you had rookies, 82 tops? Yeah, like, 82 tops. I just had like traded. hundreds of them. And, and then it turns out like I went to uh, recently, you know, went to get them valued. And of course they're not graded and people looking at them and going, I thought this was mint, but no, it's like a six. It's like, no. Because when you and I like were in the game, mint. here's why. Because you and I came up in the game when there was nothing around centering. Yeah. It was all corners and creases. I know. I it know. was all corners and creases. even what we thought was mint still. The difference, like mint starts at like, you know, six or seven now. And then you get the really eight and then nine. And then ten is like gem mint, perfect, you know. When so. did cards become not cool to you? Like what ha- what happened? So you're a little bit older than me. So it kind of like you went through high school during the era that no, it was I'm, still on fire. Yeah. Were you in the game? High school, yep. did it in college. Yep, it was still, still then. That's still, right. Still was into it. And then uh, I think I got really depressed when, like, grading, suddenly if a card wasn't graded, it wasn't worth anything. And then I would get some cards graded, and they come back, like, bad grades. And I'm like, oh, man, everything. It's like, over. All these rookie cards, like, I bought for, like, these Cal Ripken rookies. I bought them for, like, 30 bucks m- mint rookies, which would, if there was a PSA 9 or something, would be worth, you yes, know. Yes, hundreds. Thousand or and something. Thousands, you know, hundreds, to thousand, yeah. Yep. And uh, and they're basically like now they're coming back six five like it was just so depressing. I'm like oh so this card is like still only worth twenty bucks. It was just uh, I was like you know what forget this. Then I got like a resurgence you know uh, like in my mind of like okay I'm gonna just like get back into it start buying some tens some like really good. When you got older and had yeah a when little I got older more, had yeah. some more money and stuff uh-huh. and uh, and then and then I just yeah. Evolves, yeah. ebbs and flows. Yeah. What was it? So what happened? When did you take your entrepreneurial game to the next level? College? After college? College. I did uh, did a hedge fund in college. Learned learned a ton there. That was kind of a cool thing. But the next. Well, let's talk about that. That's a little. That's a pretty intense leap. You yeah. College. You decide <laughs> you know what a hedge fund is. Well, I started. I was uh, so into stocks as a kid. I Got started it. tracking stocks like ten years old. Like Got in it. a book. Got like it. Kellogg. Here's the yep. price every Sunday. And then I started reading books on the McGee and Edwards technical analysis of stock trends and derivative books were you in a, seventh grade. Were you a good student? No. Yeah, me neither. No. So what, what did you do for college? I was reading, <laughs> they were reading like, you know, history and reading literature and I was reading, you know, books on derivatives. Well, trade, this is what know? I'm talking about. <laughs> I would sit in class because I knew I was going to be in the wine business at that point and would memorize the wine spectator and would like look at my friends who were making fun of me that I was a bad student. I'm like, you're reading the Scarlet Letter. Yeah. Like, fuck you. <laughs> like, who gives a fuck? Cat, fuck Catcher in the Rye. Yeah. I'm sure I'll figure out the theme of that fucking story yeah. in life. Oh, well, Cliff Notes tell you really quick. What I couldn't even was. read that shit. Yeah, no, I. I that yellow thing. Yeah, I didn't fuck with thing. that. But, yeah, I, I didn't get through that either. <laughs> I, I got through this. I could read the summary of the Cliff Notes. I could, like sit, I could sit and take the so test and like know. draw a Bart Simpson like character and write like a, I used to write nice, I used to, literally they would give me a test <laughs> in English. Miss Horvath, if you're listening to this, if anybody knows Miss Horvath from North Hunter in High School, 1990 <laughs> to 1994, please send her this because she might remember this. She would give me a literature test and I would do two things. Draw a character, literally in the answer number one, draw this Bart Simpson looking like character and number two, Write her 
a charming sentence of like, I really like the way that you handled Brian <laughs> Bennington's outburst <laughs> last week. And you know, I know that I might not be achieving to the level that you want, but I really, really like what you're doing for <laughs> Megan Murphy. <laughs> like, like, she's like, you know, like, and that That's so rarely worked, but once in a blue moon, I'd get like was, a B but, but, for that. I was the, well, okay, you know, I didn't, I was the same in literature. There was, there was one test I'll never forget. It was like, I knew nothing. I didn't read the books. I knew nothing. And I just sat down, put my name on the front, and I asked, I said, you know, when you're done, can you bring your paper up and go to study hall? She said, yeah, when you finish, yeah, just go to study hall. So I got up, <laughs> yeah, put it up, and gave it in. She goes, Mark, you didn't answer anything. You're like, yeah. I said, well, I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. She said, you know, this is going to be a zero. I said, well, I assumed it would be zero because yeah. <laughs> I didn't do anything. And then she said, you know, this means you're going to get an F, F in this class. I said, yeah, I pretty much assumed yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I assumed that walking in day one. Before I would <laughs> cover my book with a brown paper bag, I already knew an F was well on its way. <laughs> All right, so you start a hedge fund. Did you make money? You actually did. Not as the much way as I you would thought. Recommend, well, yeah. not the way. It was pretty much luck. Yeah. Um, and then it was the stress of doing it as it a like, kid with people's money. I'm like, yeah, forget this. Whose <laughs> money? Just, whose money were you taking? Uh, it was like so funny. We had like this a couple like wealthy kids on campus got the money from their dad. It was like I, I don't even know how, how who would give like a, a couple college. So kids then what some happened? Money. I did this with a friend. Um, so then we just we actually made some money, but it was too stressful. And then and we, 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 we you know gave money back, shut it down, and then uh, and then the next thing I did, I went to work in a bank because I knew stocks and, and derivatives and everything as a kid and so went to work at Bankers Trust and uh, and then got into financial risk management which was kind of a hot thing then where okay. like you're managing like what's the risk the bank's taking on their proprietary books and derivatives and options and stocks and bonds and stuff like that. Arb and hedge. Yeah. So I got into risk which was which was pretty cool right up my alley. I was always good at math and stuff so I like that. So um, this was early mid 20s? Yeah. Early twenties. And how did you? So you were having fun, making some money. Having fun, making some, some money. Saving some money. Yep. Okay. Yeah, saving some money, and uh, and then you know, got this idea with um, this guy Lev that you know there was no there was no certification exam for. Wait. So, Lax Lev, like you're you're into these. <laughs> Hells, yeah. 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 So if there's a loose sitting out there right now who wants to do business with you, they should reach out. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> So, so uh, you know, basically, in this field of financial risk management, it's pretty new. There's a chartered financial analyst. There's a you know CPA. There's all these you know certification exams. Nothing for financial risk managers. So I kind of just got the idea, like, why don't why don't we create a certification exam for risk managers? Everyone's like, dude, you're like 24 years old. Like, who's going to take your exam? Like, how you can't just you can't just certify people. Yeah, like, sure I you said, can. why not? I'm gonna certify That's how people. everything works. Yeah, I'm just going to certify people. And so, so we what should I, trade rocks, and then we believe that cash was right. Yeah. And now people think cryptocurrency. I mean, so of course crazy. you can. So it's crazy. So, so people say all the time, they say, well, how do you do something like that? How do you get started? I said, first of all, you don't overthink it. Basically, put up a website, and we said, here's everything that's going to be on the exam. Here's what we're going to test you for. And we picked the date like a year out, and we said, here's the date, 500 bucks. Here's everything on the test. How'd and you mark? How'd happens. you how'd you market the website? Um, you know, keyword in Google, keyword search stuff. What year was this? This was ninety six. Mm -hmm. So it's pre Google. Uh, maybe it wasn't Google. Maybe it was Yahoo. other search engine. Yahoo. Yahoo. Yeah, yeah. yeah, search engine. Yeah, Yahoo. Ask Jeeves. <laughs> I, think I remember we, the big moment was when they dropped the ass. They're like, now it's just Jeeves. I'm like, yeah. all right. Yeah. <laughs> dog pile. Yeah. I don't know if you're, I'm going into like hardcore old school. Dog pile, yeah, I remember. Do you remember dog the, pile? Uh, uh, Lycos. Lycos. Yep. Yeah, Lycos. <laughs> yep. Okay, yeah. so you did that. So, and then oh, we started getting checks. <laughs> yeah, right. And we're like, oh shit, we got to write this exam. So me and Lev like sat down and like wrote Tell, Real quick, because this is fun for young entrepreneurs. <laughs> Tell me the moment when you came home and in your mailbox, you open it, and there's an act, that first $500 check. $500 you, check. You were like, holy shit. I was like, holy shit, that's really funny. Some some guy <laughs> yeah. actually like sent a check in. Like, that's really funny. Like, does right. he know there's like nothing behind yeah. this? And then another check, another, we got 34 checks. We made 17 grand in checks. And we're like, and then we looked at each other, Lev and I were like, I guess we have to write this exam. What did Le what was Lev doing? Lev, Lev <laughs> was actually a uh, risk manager also yep. at, at, at Credit Suisse, and uh, and we you knew together. him from school, or you? No, no, we worked, worked together. together. At, at you liked him right away. Yeah, he's a, he's actually a, a, a rocket scientist. He's a nuclear like you know guy from Russia. Yeah, this Russian guy Lev. Lev, those fucking Russians. We became a good Russians. friend, 
And it was just fun. And, and, and so, yeah, so we sat like weekend after weekend writing this exam. And I'm like, you know, he's older than me, but, but I'm, I'm 24, you know, like just learning the field. And we're like writing this examination that we're going to give people. And then we wrote the exam. We went down. Thank God York. Lev was there. The guy, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we administered the exam to these 34 people. And we got back and we're like, all right, now, now who uh, do we pass and who do we fail? So we basically just <laughs> decided we were going to like, you know, the top 50% were going to pass and the bottom 50% were going to fail. <laughs> we, we just drew a line. We sent the certificates out said, hey, you passed. You're, you're an FRM. Uh, and now, by the way, this exam is given in like 50 countries around the world to like 10,000 people a year or something, something crazy like that today. Right now? Yeah, right now. Is Leb running it? No. It's like you we, guys we, sold it? We, we just we, we, we gave it away. It's a long story. But, <laughs> Fair enough. But <laughs> All right. So you, you, you build this thing. Then what happens? Um, yeah. Then that, that was kind of that. So yep. we, we built it, worked on it and stuff. We gave it to the not-for-profit association called GARP. Okay. And... Uh, and just got the bug for entrepreneurship. It was like really fun to like basically just create something from nothing. So what happened and then next? I'm about seven years into my banking career. I'm chief risk officer now at Sanwa Bank. As a youngster. Yeah, like 27 so, years old. Yeah. Basically Whiz making kid. a ton of money. Okay. I'm making like a half a million bucks a year at 27. Right. I'm like top of the world, chief risk officer. It couldn't, life couldn't be better f- for someone my like age. Yep. It was great. And then I just, I just had this thing like I didn't want to be sitting here 10, 20 years. I didn't want to like yeah. be in banking. I wanted to start a business and be an entrepreneur. So I just got the nerve up and decided I'm going to quit and be an entrepreneur. And I just went into my boss's office and I, I just, one day I woke up, I just said, I'm going to do it. I went in there and I said, hey, I'm, I'm going to quit and be an entrepreneur. And the, the guy laughed at me. What year was that? This was 99. Yeah. Long before it was cool to do what you did. Yeah. 99. Okay. And? And, and uh, he, he laughed at me, thought I was crazy. Said, hey, didn't you just have a baby? I said, yeah. He said, you know, you make, you're paying you a lot of money. I said, yeah, I know. He said, well, well, you must have a great idea. I said, I don't have an idea yet, but I know I need to like focus and go all in on this thing and just basically cut the line and just go all in. And he's like, man, you're serious. He's like, well, here, I'm going to put 50 grand in. I don't know what it is, but like if you're crazy enough to do this, I think you're going to make it work. Wow. And he put 50 grand in. I didn't know anybody with money at the time. Like, so he put 50 grand in. And basically, he introduced me to two friends, and they introduced me to two friends and two friends. I wind up pitching like 120 angel investors. Right, because this was the last, this was the first no VCs era. Or anything. Right, this was the first era of like this Silicon, like this was a hot time. Yeah. 99 was yeah. similar to now, where like, the NASDAQ you could, you could crashed get, like a year later. I'm aware, yeah. which is why I'm <laughs> saying the story, because there's a bunch of dopes right now about to quit, think they're gonna do something and lose, and I wanna make sure that they're very careful to make sure they're good, and they love, what you know, they, they think this through because it's cool again, and this was the first time it was cool to do that. And so, what was the business? It was a sports stock market. It was actually where you can buy and it's called the pit. You can buy and sell athletes like stocks. We had a ticker, we had market makers, we had price charts and things, and you can basically uh, go in and buy like. I remember. I will tell you my pit story. I oh, you know the pit? Not only do I know the pit, Mark, <laughs> I decided that Josh Beckett and the Marlins were going to beat the Yankees in the World Series. Yeah. So I went on the pit and bought a ton of Beckett, rook, uh, Josh Beckett rookie cards. Oh, that's so funny. And the night they beat the Yanks <laughs> and he like pitched the gem, I sold them all yeah. and made a nice little chunk. Oh, that is great. So you story. sold at the tops. Yeah, sold at the tops, and uh, that was it. Was basically inside of a year. Started it, built it, sold it inside of a year, and uh, good that, exit. It was the mar- solid. Yeah, yes, we we actually. Gave money, a little bit of money. It was $5 million we raised, and we sold it for 5.7. So people made a little bit of money in a time when the market crashed. Yeah, you, and you learned. And learned. And everyone was like, I can't believe I got my money back like on this thing. Like I lost everywhere else. Like the whole market Yeah, it was a up. shit market. It was just a shit show. And, and so, yeah, so everyone at 60 Angel Investors, they're all like, hey, listen, this was amazing. Like if you do something again, count me in. Right, because you and, won during a time that few did. Yeah. Yeah, so that was, that was a great, great era for me too with winelibrary.com. Like I, I was really winning then yeah. because the jokes we were making about people spending money on TV before we started this podcast, I was doing the the reason I knew the pit was I'm like this is innovation. Yeah. Like I don't want to hold my you know everybody right now in the sports card world is like who's this guy? I've been doing this the whole time quietly in a different way and like the pit was probably one of the more it's funny you bring that up. It's one of the times I really really looked at the market for the first time post being into it. From eighty seven. It's so to funny thinking back though. It's so easy to look back and say we just we just it could have been huge. Like it, it, we just had to create a proxy for the athlete instead That's of right. using the actual card. 
and if we would have done that and just like but yeah. the concept of the card, like, I, I, look, I think physical goods are a real part of society. I, I think there's some startups right now building that are going to build a true marketplace that are going to hold the cards. Yeah. And it's going to work. Yeah, I think that's right. It's going to work. I think that's right. Uh, so the pit happens. I understand you put yeah. a W up, a tiny W, but a huge W in my mind because I know how hard it was to navigate during that time. You found this exit. Obviously, I understand why the angels, I would do the same. I'm an angel and do that at times. They're like, okay, this kid's got it. Yeah. What happens next? Yeah, and then uh, inside of Tops, I was out. They sent me to Seattle to run this game company called Wits Kids. Right. And that's like, I, I'd always been like really about numbers and analytics and spreadsheets, and I was so mathematical. And that was the first real experience. I think everyone needs this to get that the other side uh, of the story, you know, the this, this sort of softer side. And, and the gamers, it was all passion driven. Everything, everything that gamers thought about was, was like related to the quality of the product and passion and numbers didn't matter. And so I remember I made a big mistake. Actually, there was the, a game board and the game board was like, you know, let's say it was 14 inches or something, you know, the game board, the gamers played and stuff. And it was like way more expensive than like a 12 inch. It was like two inches shorter. It was way cheaper. We we're gonna save a ton of money, like a million bucks a year. And I'm like, guys, did they really care about these extra two inches? Come on, 12, 12 inch looks just as good as 14 and we're gonna save a million bucks. And some people in the gaming industry said, no, you can't do that, you don't understand. And I said, uh, it seems, I'm gonna make these squares a little bit short, you know, whatever, disaster. They rebelled and it was a, the whole thing blew up. But I kind of was like appreciated that, that it, it's not all math and numbers and was science. That the, was, that the, was that the first time that really in your face you're like fuck the gray matters as much as the black and white yes yeah yeah the gray matter i really learned a lot i came from the you know it's funny we have so many similarities and i came from the opposite direction yeah i was so gray and intuitive yeah right i sold my entire card collection and went into comic books and toys 4 months before the market collapsed wow cuz i could cuz i could i was i was gray yeah you're intuitive i was gray yeah. i didn't you know and so and over the last 20 years, I've developed more appreciation for the black and white. Mm -hmm. and, but I still am a gray leader with a respect for black and white. And I would argue that you're probably, based on your natural talents, a black and white leader with a respect for gray. Yeah, no, I think it's funny you say that. I, I think I've actually gone to the other side. Wow. I've gone full on. So, like, I, I am... Well, that's even more awesome and speaks to why you, you went on to have two monsters after that because it... it it speaks to you have the natural talent to be yeah. such a juggernaut in black and white. I, know I can only close the gap on black and white so much. Yeah. I can only get so interested in numbers. It's that, it, that's interesting. Well, I know what I don't know too. Like the numbers looks great, but I, I often probably you know 80, 90% of the time I'm looking to why the numbers aren't telling the story. You know well, the I mean? numbers, it's, as yeah. you know, almost always are looking backwards. Yeah. Yeah. I that's where people get fucked. Yep. It's They're like, Gary, this and that. I'm like, that's nice. That's last year. Yeah. I don't give a fuck about that because <laughs> we have to sell this thing tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what happens just, next? Uh, so then got this idea for uh, diapers.com, which was a beast. Um, and, and literally, people say, "How do you get the idea?" I was just on Google searching keywords to see how many times they were searched. Back then, you could see how many times they were searched. I remember. And it was like diapers were searched two hundred thousand times in the month. And I'm like, "That's so interesting. You can't really buy diapers online. Not even Amazon. You couldn't really buy them at good prices. They were like inflated prices." And I'm like, "Wow, diapers. Everyone needs diapers. Like, and it's a pain in the butt. If I can deliver them overnight, great service at good prices, isn't every mom in America gonna like want to do that?" And that was the like the original thesis going in. And people said, that's great, but you can't ship diapers overnight because you're gonna lose a ton of money. And they're a loss leader for brick and mortar for a reason. And I said, well, yeah, but that that's right. They're a loss leader for a reason because they drive people into the store. So I'm not gonna make money on diapers online. I'm gonna make money on everything else. <laughs> and so so I just had to go. And this is it's basically pretty much self-funded. I did this with, with uh, another friend, Vinny, and... Uh, <laughs> This is just too good. I need a fucking like, I need like a Reservoir Dogs like poster with you, Lev, Lax, Lax, and Vinny. I mean, I'm not sure if you've actually been a good entrepreneur or your undercover mob life, and you just like force people into like, you're gonna make this, you're gonna buy these diapers at a loss, or you're gonna hear from fucking Lev. You know, you know, it's so funny though. Like people, all, so so literally started this business, and. Uh, and we're selling a box of diapers, literally for, for 90 cents. So we're gonna buy them for a dollar and sell them for 90 cents. P&G wouldn't sell us, Huggies wouldn't sell us, Kimberly Clark. We had to go to Costco and BJ's 
Buy them. Buy them and then sell them and make I knew money that. in every box. I knew that. Yeah, we Sorry. lost money in every box. Of course, loss and, leaders and, are smart. And people are like, but, because we were, we were, yeah, how much funding did you guys put in? Like how much did you guys give yourself a runway? I mean, our sales to start it, it was, every, it was just me and him did everything. We put in like a couple hundred grand in each or something. It was like Super not small. a lot of money. Yeah. No. And, how and much did you pay for diapers.com or did it start as diapers.com? It started as 1-800-diapers because we couldn't afford diapers.com. I figured. That's why I asked the question. <laughs> and diapers.com was 600 grand, the domain. At the time when you bought it. Yeah. 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 Big number. But that we had, but we had raised like 4 million bucks, Series A. Um, so what happened was you and Vinny got enough action going and then you went and raised capital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah we got to about 11 enough. million run rate and we showed, we had strong cohorts and things were, yeah, we kind of bootstrapped it. We were, we were literally- you got it to almost a million a month in revenue. Yeah. Driving to BJ's, buying the diapers, doing- Fuck you. Them, selling them out. Seriously. Yeah. 11 million run rate on, I mean, at that point, you had somebody with a van going to BJ's, right? Yeah, yeah, not, not only that. At we, first, it was you in the car, it right? It was us in the car, That's yeah. all I needed. And here, here's the funny, the funny thing was here. By the way, kids, the most important part of this whole fucking story is this. When you're the kind of kid that grabs weeds for four hours a day, <laughs> or shovels snow for seven hours, or makes sets all summer long while everybody else is playing, you build a gear inside of you that leads to the humility to actually go and pick up the diapers yeah. <laughs> at BJ's, even yeah. after you've had some levels of success, even after you made $500,000 a year when you were 27. Even, yeah. like, I always, my mom and I always make jokes to each other. I always, when she does something, I'm always like, you can take a girl from Russia, but you can't take Russia from the girl. And that's how I think about it. Like, so many of my friends are like, why don't you hire people to like bid for you on eBay yeah. and like like what are you doing <laughs> on the sports card yeah, that yeah. I'm hot on right now? I'm like, mm, I'm gonna do the work. Yeah, you do the work. I do the work. By the way, that's how you learn. You do the <laughs> no work. Shit. You learn the detail, intimate details of everything. But anyway, a thousand cases a day. I apologize one more time, Mark, because <laughs> I want value for the audience. This is why I don't begrudge students. I don't begrudge smart people or people that like to learn. I begrudge just staying only in classrooms and books because you never do, which means you actually don't know. Yeah, yeah, I agree. We got up to a thousand cases a day. Now it was untenable. Like you just couldn't. Yeah, where the just, fuck? What? Like BJ's just, and Costco were pumped. Yeah. Well, we would have to clear out multiple BJ's. We all. Anyway. Were you making like backroom? Were you like? Well, you had, did you have to deal. go to the yeah. managers and be like, "Hey, let's save yeah. each other a bunch of time. But Why don't you, you just keep you the fucking things on the pallets? We'll come and pick it up." That's exactly what we started of course. doing. Of Yeah. So, but here's the here's the here's the great thing. We had this deal where they would do that if we left them diapers for their customers. So we'd always leave them some diapers, <laughs> right? Then we we couldn't do more than a thousand cases a day. It was just impossible. Where the fuck we was had your warehouse? To buy from Procter and Gamble. I get it. Where was your warehouse? Like garage, yard, like Jersey. Yards. Yeah, love it. So 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 then <laughs> we had to buy direct from Procter and Gamble. Procter and Gamble still doing a thousand cases a day. Like we're not selling you. We think it's not gonna it's not gonna work. We're not selling you. Like dude, we can't we can't buy all the diapers. So then we said, all right, you know what? We know what we're gonna do. We're gonna go into BJ's. We're gonna go. We're taking all their diapers. I don't care if they don't stack this. The, the shit like we're taking all the diapers <laughs> you know why because when they screamed at us and they said like you can't take all the diapers and I'm like yeah we can and we did and they're like i'm like listen you could fix this Just call, call procter, procter and gamble. gamble you can fix this and they did they called procter and gamble and procter and gamble called us and said hey listen we still don't believe in you bj's is a really important customer they told us to sell you so we will but we don't think it's going to work and we still think it's you know and, and that's how we got procter and gamble and then what's Once ironic, you got Proctor, you got everybody else. Yeah. And what's ironic is like just, I don't know, a year ago, I'm walking around the the, the office and Proctor and Gamble's in there and I see the presentation and I pop in. I'm like, hey, what are you guys doing? It's like, oh, we're just talking about market share diapers, how, you know, how it's like, you know, X percent online and it's going to 70 percent online and how people are never going to come to the store to buy diapers anymore. I'm like, oh, interesting. OK, great. Great. <laughs> I just walked out with a I big love smile. That yeah, that's I'm like, I'm like, oh, man. How much? <laughs> actually, it's a fun question because this. How much do you play for that moment? Honestly, oh, on some real shit. I like, love re it. yeah, me too. I like, I, love it. I would freaking argue with it. you that I, I believe that's it. the only reason I do what I do for a yeah. living. Yeah, it's just that fun. that feeling. Yeah, that's so fun. That like, so fun. like the feeling of all my team who was making fun of me behind my back for buying sports cards a year and a half ago, <laughs> and I know them. I'm watching them, and they're giggling behind my back. Silly. He liked it when he was a kid. Like, it's not gonna work. To then like watch them all scramble now and like try to like, <laughs> oh they're like God. all borrowing money from their parents <laughs> to like put all into sports cards is like 
I do it for that, yeah, not for too. the, it's the game. Me too, me too. For that I told you so moment. Yeah. I, w I do fun things like that all the time, even like you know, go to the horse track, figure out a way to like beat the system. And it could be like, turn like, you, you can't bet too much because you'll move the odds, but you know, bet 100 bucks and be guaranteed to win like 120, it's really fun. Like it's 20 bucks, I don't need 20 bucks, it's, it's just fun. It's just that you figured it out. Figured it out. Did you love the, the mammoth I used to track? card count in Atlantic City. <laughs> You know how fun that was going down there and like as a kid, as a teenager. I'm and coming so back glad and I didn't money. have this math skill level. I would have been completely <laughs> obnoxious. Like, you know, I was more on like, I think like you know, it's funny. I really have the gray version of this. I'm like, like all the things, literally everything that I thought America was going to do happened. Like for example, right now I 100% know that straight young men are going to wear makeup in 12 years. That male makeup is a real category. Money in the bank. Can't wait to show this clip <laughs> in 12 years <laughs> on whatever the TikTok and Instagram is. It's locked. Yeah. It's already happened. I know. Wow. The dollar twenty. Now, as you can imagine, <laughs> I'm in the process of building what machine I'm building for infrastructure long term. We played it a little bit different, like, but very similar. But at some point, I'm going to be ready in my career to say, okay, that's what's going to happen, and I'm going to start the Olay or the Glossier or the whatever, and it's I'm gonna sell it for $4 billion and I'm gonna call you and, and be like, I'm ready to buy the Jets yeah. and let's go. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me invest first. Well, I may, I, may, I may let you do that. <laughs> we gotta talk sports cards off. Like, it's about to get so uncomfortably hot the next 24 months. Okay, well, I'm, I'm ready to come in now. I'm, I'm, I've been you know what like, you know, itching you to know what You know what it is, Mark? You'll appreciate this. Like, here you are sitting. Uh, by the way, because we're wrapping up, diapers.com goes and crushes crushes, uh, he then goes, uh, he sells that uh, to Amazon, he then goes and starts Jet.com. At that point, because it was a great jersey, e I, I always was like, at that point in my career, I was getting so much credit for this little wine business e-commerce thing, I was like, why aren't they looking at the diapers.com guy? He's done it way bigger than me. <laughs> uh, then you start Jet, and I see that, I'm like, shit, that's gonna, and I knew, you know, it's funny to hear the Costco BJ story, because <laughs> I remember how you positioned that, and I'm like, that's gonna, and then the Walmart acquisition, which is a huge one, and congratulations on that, and you're still there three and a half years later, which is an impressive part of the conversation. That was obvious to me. And now you're doing, now you're becoming almost like, you know, now with the way entrepreneurship is, I mean, you literally raced Jerry Rice in the 40 <laughs> at the NFL Combine this last week. I I'm excited that you're starting to get some, I've always thought you were wildly underrated. There's very few people in the last decade that I've watched operate. And yeah. now that I'm getting to know you a little better, we had a meeting not too long ago and now we're doing this. I'm like, oh, this makes sense. Like your playbook is something I deeply respect. Um, and I, I, I've always felt that out of all the entrepreneurs in this last decade, that you were quite under the radar. And you know, mm -hmm. I don't know your personality traits. And there's, yeah. you know, there's plenty of people building trillion dollar companies that nobody's ever heard of. And there's plenty of people that have a million followers on Instagram that are going to flop in four minutes. That people think are good at entrepreneurship. But I've, I've always really respected you from afar. And I really like that you like sports cards. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, where, where I'm going with that though is like, I think the reality is, is that it's a skill that never. I almost feel like it's a skill that never gets out of your body. Yep. Yeah. You know, like I'm sitting here with you right now, you're 48, I'm 44, and when I tell you, I'm like, my God, like we're gonna be having this conversation in 40 years. Yeah, I know. Like I we're gonna be sitting somewhere, Mars, <laughs> the track, at a flea market, you know, in a boardroom, and we're literally gonna be like, oh, we've known each other for 40 years. <laughs> and we said 40 years ago that we would be sitting here doing this shit, and that's just the I, nature I find, of the game. I don't know what it is. I, I have more drive now than I did any time in my life before. Oh, it's not even close. I think it's yeah. momentum yeah. of being in your spot. Like, it's not even close. I would take a shit on 28 year old me. Yeah. That kid couldn't even compete with me. <laughs> I feel the same way. I couldn't, it's not even in my world. I feel the same that, way. That that dude sucks. Yeah. I feel the same I way. I would beat the shit out of him. Yeah. I could work harder now than I did then. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, 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 I agree. I agree. Anyway, what any anything that we didn't touch on as we wrap up here any parting wisdom for the kids and the not kids that are listening? No, anybody who's thinking about starting a business though, I I'd say go for it. Right, because the go loss is worth it, right? Yeah. Do you say go for it that blazant because you also realize that regret is scarier than everything and if it's really in you, whether you completely, like I keep telling people. I, the fear I, is what drives you. To, I also think like if, if you're scared to do it and you do it, you're gonna put in the best you've got. 
and that's what it's going to take. But if you but if you put in the best you've got, you're going to make things happen. I don't know where it's going to lead. You're going to go through failures. You might have some ups and downs. But if you just stay at it and just go after it, and, and Mark, and be I think relentless. I think once people start making the world about happiness, not money, then this is going to make a lot more logic. Yes, because a lot of people go yeah. for it, have a nice home in Summit, New Jersey, right now, make four twelve a year, life is good, kids in private school, good shit, Jersey Shore house, like good shit, good shit, and they're going to listen to us two Jersey bozos, and they're gonna be like, fuck it, I'm unhappy, I'm going for it. Yeah, and the story for Hank is it's actually going to fail, yeah. because what Hank was was yep. a number six. Yep. He yep. was a number six, yeah. a great number six. Yep. You know, it's the Scotty Pippen thing. Mm-hmm. Scotty Pippen is all-time overrated, in my opinion, because he had a great all-time number one hiding it. Yeah. And when he went to Portland and he went to Houston, no. And and by the way, Hank right now at 412 a year is listening to us and go for it. Let me just finish this thought and I can see you want to jump in. Go. You have no, to no. go? No, no, I have to go. Oh, you have to go to the bathroom. So go, <laughs> I'll finish this. Go. Oh, yeah, go, go take a peek. So let me finish my thought. One, I find it fascinating that Mark couldn't hold it. Like, I, I just think that's all time interesting out of all the things. Number two, on the Scotty Pippen thing, it's not to raz Scotty, and of course this is coming from a Knicks fan who's bitter, but Hank, if you're listening, Mark's right, not because of the money, but because of the happiness. Because if you're 44 and your life is good, but you hate your fucking job, you hate it. You, you really know you actually hate it, but you like your life. I, what you need to ask yourself is do you like your life because of the financial things that are happening and it, you look happy versus actually being happy? Because I can tell you when you make that jump and you fail and you have to have the shame, and that's the word I'm gonna use, the shame to move your family out of Summit and move into another town and you got a 12 and a nine year old who are now crying because they're going to a different school and they went from being fancy to maybe less fancy. Like that is a lot of carnage that most people don't have the stomach for. The problem is that nobody tells you is that at 72 years old, you spend the next 20 years of your life in regret because you weren't happy. And that is not fucking easy. And I don't say this lightly, but when I hear Mark say, go for it, I actually understand it because I spend a lot more time analyzing what 70 and 80 and 90 year olds say and I understand why a 44 year old doesn't have the strength to disappoint their kids or to look stupid in front of their friends or to like confuse the world. And it's easier at 27 even with a new kid than it is at 44, which is why I love the internet. Mark and I are byproducts. We would be totally different men in our careers if the internet didn't come along. If you listen to his stories, Google and diapers and, and landing page and $500 check and the pit, we are the byproducts of our age of the entrepreneurs that had practical opportunity on the internet that would have never existed if we were 40 years earlier, that's what I want for everybody to realize. We understood that and that's what we navigated on. You can have a side hustle too. So we talked about Hank quitting. Let's talk about Hank instead of golfing for four hours on Saturday. Let's talk about Hank instead of coming home and having a glass of wine and watching the news, The Daily Show, or sports. If you're really unhappy with what you do for a living, give me back those 14 hours that you waste each week and set up a landing page. Set up an Instagram account around Star Trek or soccer or sports cards. Side hustle practicality with patience where you build it, where where Mark and Lev had to look at each other and say, fuck, maybe there's something here now. Notice what he did. He did what I do. Do shit. That's and then let the market show you there's something there, and then grow, right? He, yeah, like you just gotta put the time in, right? The time. That's this the goes, key. brother. It's the weeds. Yeah, it's pulling the weeds. The weeds. The Too many people are entitled and don't want to waste their time when their time ain't worth shit. It's yeah. a good way to end it. Thank you, pal. Thank you.